We are here with Fanta, Fanta Bela, and uh, I'm excited. And she's out of New York, and we're working on a project to bring her to Kansas City in the summer. So I give you the floor, young lady. Hello, um, my name is Fanta Bala. I'm from Harlem in New York. I'm a poet, activist, artist, teaching artist. I work a lot with the kids and the youth in New York, and I'm also a basketball coach. And just a little about myself, um, I do a lot of poetry, and I use poetry as a form of activism and also a tool to motivate the youth to, like, talk about their feelings. And I'm really big advocate on mental health and getting young people to advocate for themselves, do their words. Okay. How old are you? Um, I'm 21. I actually turn 22 tomorrow, so. Looking like you're 16. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us a little bit more information? Where did you go to school at? Where was you born at? And yeah. uh, how did you come about writing this poetry? Yeah, so um, I went to, for college, I went to um, Bar College at Simons Rock for two years. I actually started college early. So I started college at the age of 15. I did two years, got my associate's degree, and then I ended up transferring to the university at Albany. Did two more years there, got my bachelor's at 19. Um, I, ma I majored in economics with a minor in theater. Um, shortly after I graduated, though, I decided that I didn't want to work at the bank. I didn't want to work corporate. Like, I wanted to be in these communities. I wanted to be impacting these people. So that's why I ended up transferring over to the art side. Poetry, I started writing poetry when I was 11 years old. And for a long time, it was just a hobby. It was something I did. It was never something I seen as a career. It was never something I seen as profitable. I never thought writing or the arts was po profitable until... I would say my junior year of, or the summer of my junior year, I started posting my poetry a lot more online. Ended up garnering the attention of singer songwriter Shawn Mendes, who ended up giving me a grant to publish my first book, which I did for all the things I never got to say. Um, and then that just opened the door for a whole lot of things. He invited me on his tour. So I did a couple, I opened up for him a couple of times. Um, and that just pushed me to be like, I need to be doing this poetry thing. There's money there, but there's also so much impact there, and I'm just more happy there. So that's how the switch happened, and that's how I'm here today. Congratulations. I know uh, before uh, we end this session, uh, which you shared that poetry you did on Tamara Hall, but yeah. I wanted to do some more information. So... We, when we talked over the phone, you said that uh, some of your family members was impacted by incarceration. Can yeah. You explain a little bit more, share with the audience. Yeah. So my brother, well, we're not blood, but we're basically blood. Um, He had turned himself in. He had to turn himself in. Probably like he's been locked up now for two years. Um. And unfortunately, due to, he was supposed to be home November 30th. Unfortunately, they pushed his day back. So it's looking like he's going to be home like probably a year and a half from now. So, and it's kind of like, I didn't realize how much of a toll it would take on me until I realized that he was actually turning himself in. And just that psychological thing of seeing someone like turn themselves in and then knowing that once they walk through those court doors, like, you're not going to be able to see them again. Like the, It makes you look at your idea of freedom and your idea of free a, a way differently and just the mental toll it takes on not just you being home, but also the person that's in there and all the stuff they go through. And like you got to hear, oh, they're in a box or you got to hear, oh, they need money to eat or the CEO did this. And it's like, it really made me realize that like, it's so much that like could be re rehabilitated and so much that could be done before a person goes to prison. Um, and then when once that person is in there, it's not just them in prison. It's kind of like everyone that's attached to them is doing that time with them. That's and it's true. like a mo emotional roller coaster the whole way through. You don't know what really is going to happen in that whole time. You also have to live your life and navigate your life. So it took a real toll, especially with my, um, my, poetry album because before he turned himself in he went to every studio session with me um and 
after he turned himself in, I haven't even brought myself to able to go to a studio since. Like tomorrow on my birthday is going to be the first day I've gone to a studio since he turned himself in. So I ended up finishing my album at home. Um, so it's kind of like that mental battle that you you people don't really think about, right? It's not just that person just went to jail and okay, like when they they went to jail and they'll come back. No, that whole time life still goes on and it's a lot of stuff that you have to unpack. You have to help them unpack and it affects everyone. It's not just one person that gets affected. First of all, forgive me, but uh, happy birthday. Oh, uh, thank I you. I pray that you truly have a, a good time tomorrow. Uh, thank you. And you enjoy yourself and you take care of yourself. Uh, thank you. And you continue to stay focused. But also we talked about, you know, because you keep coming back to the mental health and that's what's important. Mm-hmm. What do you think that the community, when it comes to mental health, uh, we all have, most of us have experienced this violence, not only with uh, in, within your own city, but the world has been so much violence that people has been, families has been impacted by so many young people, older people, babies are dying. And we're really not talking about it. Uh, we have this thing that is no snitching. What would you say about that? I would say, honestly, it comes from us not holding each other accountable in a sense of we have this notion if it's like if it's not directly affecting me, then I won't say nothing. But when that happens and everyone is doing that, when stuff come about where people do need to speak up, or when stuff come about where it's like if things are said or people take accountability for their actions, then we wouldn't be in a space where it's like, oh no stitching, or we wouldn't be in a space where people feel like they have no one to talk to, or we wouldn't be in a space where um a parent is talking to their child. And they're not recognizing the weight of their words and how that affects their child. But they don't take accountability with that. Not a child lives with that. Not a child acts out. So it's it's kind of like more like if we all do the work within ourselves to recognize how our actions affect others and how our trauma reaps out in ways that we don't recognize and how yeah. just because we swept stuff under the rug for so long and then one day we blow up and it's like if we addressed it right then if we was real with ourselves if we were real with each other if we heard our friends or our family say something that it's like it's questionable and instead of being like oh well that has nothing to do with me so I'm not gonna say nothing or I don't want to have that tough conversation right now so I'm just gonna let it go well if we address things like that that is when we can come to a space where there's healing in our community, where there's people right. taking accountability for their actions. But it's more so like the inner work, like you have to be, it's, it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to be like, I messed up this time. Like, and that doesn't make me any less of a human. That doesn't make me any less of a good person. But like my actions had a direct reflection on somebody else. And that you can't take away how somebody else is feeling, no matter how good your intentions were. So it's kind of like doing that self-work that has helped me a lot to look at situations where it's like, Fonte, you was really wrong. Like, you might have not had any bad intentions, but just because you didn't have bad intentions doesn't mean the other person wasn't directly affected by it. One of the things that, uh, could you share more about, I know you talked about your brother, but about your mother and your father, and uh, you have other siblings and, um, can you talk more about your family life? And also, I believe that um, you share is really powerful. But also, uh, some of the things we write about it impact us through distorted within our own family and stressed out into the community. Um. So I am the first generation to be born here. So my mom and dad is from Ivory Coast and Mali. And my older brother, he was born over there. So I was the first person to be born here. And it's a culture shock. It's a culture change, especially me being um, like who I am and me being so vocal about my life and knowing what I want. That's not really heard of in a traditional household. 
especially because um my parents are also Muslim, and it's it's so many rules and so it's a life that they were already accustomed to before mm. they came to America, right? And then you have a child who was born here who doesn't really know of that life that y'all grew up with. I know how to live in America, not say I've always known that I was West African. I've never denied my um Ivorian and Malian background, but also I grew up in America. I've visited Africa twice. So it's kind of that culture difference in a way of the respects and the traditions that they grew up on is learning how to respect those um traditions by while also respecting who I am and the person that I've grown up to be. And um a lot of times we Growing up, we didn't really see eye to eye. I think part of it had to deal with me just knowing who I was and having a strong voice at such a young age and not really knowing how to properly communicate exactly how I feel. And then also that language barrier between my parents. It was a lot of back and forth of not understanding each other. And I was somebody who always knew like that I, I can go. I, like my parents never was the type to come to games when I was a basketball player. My parents never came to the games. My parents probably came to like one or two shows in my whole life. So I've always been that independent child, that go getter, that one that is going to get it done. Right. Um, My parents didn't move me into college. It was just that dynamic of like parents. Well, especially like African parents feeling like if they do for you in a sense of they make sure that you have a roof over your head and they feed you they've done their job and it's kind of like growing up realizing that that's a part of parenting but that's not the only part right it's how do you continue to show up for your child through their whole development um so that was a lot that we had a lot of back and forth I have a poem called Ricochet which literally talks about mental health in an African household and it's like when you feel like you're just talking but not being understood um when your parents say stuff to you that you know they don't really mean but they're saying it out of a place of trauma, a place of unhealed wounds, and then it goes on to your child. And when you don't really acknowledge it, it just builds up. And after a long time, some some kids fold. Me, I use that as fuel to make the poetry. I use that as fuel to tell my story. But a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't use that avenue. A lot of people turn to other things. A lot of people turn to drugs. A lot of people turn to the streets. A lot of people run away from home. A lot of people neglect family. And it's like, it's stuff like that. It's, it's just little things like that that builds up over time. So me and my family now, we're getting it together. Like my relationship with my mom and my dad is getting better in a sense of like, I'm so secure in who I am. It's kind of like, this is who I am. This is what I can do. And we're going to figure out how do we navigate this life as not of how I pictured my me and my daughter relationship to be, but how it really is. So we've came, we've come, we still got a lot of work to do, but. This we 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 made it over the hump a little bit. Congratulations! I love yeah. hearing that. And uh, I would really, before we move on, I would really like for you to share that poem that mm -hmm. you just wrote about with you and your family, because there's so many other families, uh, young people uh, feel the way that you do, mm -hmm. even though we ha may have different cultures. So can you? Do you mind sharing that poem? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Let me get some water. Panta, ite to. Moko se ibe kasila, moko shima pushiki la adabla sisa sisa sisa. I'm sorry. I apologize for upsetting you, but when you yelled, I went right back to that place that I vowed to never ever go again. Took me to that place where my mama's voice became an old, so familiar ricochet, and I feel small, boxed in, closed up, trying so hard not to fall, to fail. Birthed by Africans turned American citizens, my whole life has been a hell. Mary, with these two cultural identities I carry, my mind, Papa, I show their love through necessities. And sometimes that really gets the best of me. Oh, you're so lucky to have both of your parents in your life. Oh, really? So why am I searching for paternal love so desperately? Battling demons on my own because we African, we don't believe in therapy. And I swear I wish we were more open to it because I needed one before I needed one. I wish I didn't need one before I started seeing one because it's things like mental health in an African household that's really ever talked about. 
If you're depressed, they call you lazy and assume that's going to sort it out. And if you're sad and start crying, they respond, I give you something to actually cry about. As if tears are only required when you get beat. But they don't know it's the days when you're low and the only time you hear is your heartbeat. You've been strong for too long. You're thinking about defeat. Wondering if I was going, would they finally miss me? Love me for who I am and not who they want me to be. Appreciating their child right in front of you instead of comparing to other families. The lack of compassion left me. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Like looking for mother figures and my teachers and father figures and my coaches. Drowning in my own tears. But y'all have yet to notice. No one talks about the identity crisis children and immigrant parents go through. Those days you're all alone, you just need someone to hold you. We try to do everything right, try to do what we're supposed to, but at the end of the day, we're still human. And we're not perfect. We go through pain, but we hide our scars because our parents can't see us hurting, tell us heinous things, and never once do they apologize. I swear, even when he lost his mother, I ain't never see my father cry. To this day, I still replay the time my mom told me to end it all. I know she didn't mean it, but it's not a second that goes by that I wish that I was dreaming, constantly in denial because I don't want to believe it. But she told me this when I was 12 and again when I was 19 and some days when I said, oh, be careful what you ask for because you just might receive it. And I sit and I think about this pain and some days I don't know if it'll ever be the same. People walk out of my life and I let them leave, not sure if y'all are the ones to blame. Still feel like that little kid who was waiting for the rainbow after the rain, waiting for mommy and daddy to show me love in a different way. But y'all to focus less on your actions and more of what y'all say, because sticks and stones never broke these bones. But your words, they hurt forever. And I'm hoping one day as a family, we can heal together. Thank you. Mm, I love it. I'm trying not to. Well, I'm holding my emotions in. <laughs> that was... So awesome. I'm so excited for you. I really am. I cannot wait till you get here. <laughs> you have so much to offer to the world. I mean, uh, oh, I'm trying to hold it together. I loved it. I really did. Because you spoke for so many of us. And uh, I loved it. I really Thanks. did. It. And uh, I'm excited. Again, uh, I'm smiling because I know you're doing a lot of things and you took time out of your busy schedule uh, uh, trying to move. And some people probably wonder why you're in the court because she's got <laughs> taking care of business before her birthday. And so I thank you for just taking time out and, uh, for me and for the organization. Of course. And, uh, if you had any, well, you really said something powerful, but who is your hero in your life? Do you have any heroes that you look at that, uh, uh I know your parents still support you and you, your life has yeah. gotten, your relationship has gotten better, but who are your heroes? Um, I would say my heroes are my mentors. I have Three that I could think of off the top of my head, um, Shehan, Corey, and Heather. And the reason, um, they're my heroes for three different reasons. Um, but the thing that connects them all is they heard me when I felt at my most that no one was hearing me. When I felt like at my lowest, I was screaming into an empty room. Like I felt like I was falling on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. They're three people that came to me. And heard me in different parts of my life with Shihan. He's a spoken word artist. And he heard me through my poetry. He he was the first one to tell me, Fonta, your work is good. But mm -hmm. your work can always be better, right? You're mm -hmm. in a room of people who's like, uh, right now in the room you're in, you're the best one here, right? But that doesn't mean that there's no room for you to get better. He was the first one to make me realize that like, yo, like there's more work to do. Like you're good. And he was the first one to tell me that to tell my story, right? Not tell the story of a generalization, right? Okay. So if I'm talking about Black women, talk about my experience as a Black woman. Okay. If I'm talking about mental health, talk about my relationship with mental health. And mm -hmm. he was the first one to tell me, like, you're a poet because you have a story worth telling, right? And you have the ability to tell that story. So tell your story. So I always go back to that and I always fall back to that. And every time I speak to him, I'm like, okay, I know what else to do with my life. I know what's next. 
And then with Heather and Corey, they were there when I didn't have that relationship with my mom. When I couldn't speak to her, they were there to listen to me and just be that mother figure. Like I said, looking for mother figures in my teachers and father figures in my coaches, right? Like I just needed someone to nurture me and just listen to little old Fonta and like help her navigate the world because it's not easy. And I, I always say I'm privileged enough to have people when I didn't have my parents to have people that listened to me and was there for me and help me navigate through so much things in life that now I can help other people do. But if I'd never had that for me, I would never like, I would have never known. So I guess I did a lot on my own, but I also had a village. And at that time it might've not been my blood, but it was people who cared. And it was people who thought that I, they seen something in me that they were like, Fonta, like, we got you, girl. And to this day, I say, like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know where I would be. I don't know if I would have been writing poetry. I don't know if I would have been this transformative. I don't know if I would have went to therapy. I don't know if I would have been able to reconcile my parents. I don't know what could have happened if I didn't have people, like, ground me in the moment where I needed it the most. So that's why I, I'd be like, my role models ain't no celebrities. They everyday people. All right. All right. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, as we end our segment, what thoughts, what, what is your favorite saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and what would you say to us to encourage the young people and the old people, the babies? What would you say to the world? Your word of encouragement. You ain't said a lot, but do you got a favorite phrase? Yeah. My phrase that's been my phrase, especially a lot now, is let go and let God, right? All right. With everything in life, like um, because like I have anxiety and stuff, like I overthink everything. Like I like I'm hyper like this has to be like this, 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 this. And I was just like, Fonta, just let go. Like and let God, like, let, let everything that's supposed to happen, happen. Like, things that's going to come to you, come to you. Just focus on the things you can control. And that's with everything in life, right? Like, you worry about what your job is going to say. Um, You won't know until you talk to them, right? You worry about how the show is going to go. You won't know until you perform. You worry about how many book sales you're going to have or how many album sales or how many likes you're going to get. You're not going to know until you do it, right? You worry, oh, I'm too scared to perform. You're not going to get better if you don't keep going, right? So if there's anything in life that you're hesitant about or you don't know or you're having this, just do it. Just let go. Let the universe be the universe. Let God do what he has to do for you. And just believe in yourself. And, like, have that stance of, like, even if nothing goes the way it, I thought it was going to go, it's going to maybe, maybe it'll be better, right? But you won't know. So focusing on all the the details and everything is, is not important. Just let go. Focus on the things you can't control. And, like, just live in a moment. Be grateful for where you are. Be grateful for all you've accomplished. It's easy to be driving and looking up and looking up, but you can't change lanes if you don't check in the mirror. You can't change lanes if you don't acknowledge what's behind you. So it's just like you got to just live. Like you really just got to be in the moment and just recognize that it's just a privilege. Like it's a privilege for me to even be here speaking to you, right? It's a privilege for me to be able to even tell my story and for you to hear mine, right? And I, I couldn't have planned it. I could have been on – I couldn't have said on January – First, at the end, of, at the beginning of the year, I will be here at the end of the year telling my story. Mm -hmm. to, um, that's reaching people all the way in Kansas City. Like I could, like that, that, that couldn't have, like, but it was because I've just let go, right? Even with the Tamron Hall thing, I didn't plan for it. I didn't be like, mm -hmm. I couldn't say on October I'm gonna apply for the Tamron Hall show and I'm gonna be on there. They found me, right? And it was because right. I was just doing what I was doing. So it's just like the universe is going to be the universe, but make sure you put good out without expecting nothing in return. Just be a good person. Okay, Miss Wisdom. <laughs> right, we can't wait. I know I can't wait in the community. We look forward to seeing you in May the 17th. Yep. Uh, we still got to talk and plan before then, but I'm excited because you bring a lot to the table and uh, I'm going to just say, Thank you for being the partnership with Children of Incarceration. Of and you have a blessed day. And Thank you so much. Stay safe. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. December the 9th, Saturday, uh, Charlotte Quinn Elias 
Mama Lowe will be having uh, community uh, information about families that's impacted by incarceration. This meeting will be at uh, what? Lucia Bruford Library, excuse me. The Lucia Bruford Library, 3050 Prospect. And they're, the topic is going to be talking about the reform of the Missouri prison and how it needs to be reformed regarding the second chance, regarding medical um, issues within the prison and how a lot of things are being banded and taken away uh, from the ex-offenders. And so if you can, please attend this meeting. It's going to be from two to four. If you need to talk to um, Ms. Quinn, her number is 816-621-8428. Look forward to seeing you there. It's really a great meeting again. It is impacted for family to get together for your own behalf of your loved ones and advocate for the right uh, they need inside the prison. This is brought to you by Kansas City Business Association, working to improve our community.